Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Bigger films on learning and teaching. In addition, for each of our class sessions, there will be a specific topic assigned in advance and you will be expected to prepare by studying readings designated for that particular topic. These readings will consist of chapters selected from one of the two basic texts for the course or journal articles reporting relevant research on that particular topic. For each of these readings, you will be expected to prepare a short abstract summarizing the reading and stating its main thesis. This will give me some indication that you are at least exposed to the readings and have some idea of what they're all about. These abstracts must be turned in at the beginning of each class and should begin with the statement, the thesis of this chapter or reading is, etc., etc. Now, to the matter of classroom attendance. You may expect that I will be in class at each class session. Likewise, I expect you to be in attendance. It is your instructor's prerogative as to how to handle the matter of classroom absences, but since absence can affect the grade a student receives, I'm sure you will want to take this matter into consideration before being absent from class. Participation. As I expect you to be in class, so also do I expect you to participate in class discussions. My teaching method is very simply to get at the important aspects of subject matter through discussion. That can't occur if you're not in class, and that can't occur if you do not participate. Dialogue is going to be the heart of this class. I expect you to contribute. Your grade will reflect your participation. If you are the intelligent but strong and silent type, I suggest that you find another instructor or another class that better suits your silence or meditation. And finally, to the matter of teaching philosophy. It seems to me that the best teaching and learning goes on between a teacher interested in his students and in his subject and students who are interested in learning what the teacher has to profess. Through dialogue, two intelligent minds ought to be able to seek clarity and truth. Both student and teacher are here in this academic community for the same purposes, to gain knowledge and to test knowledge. That will be our goal this semester. Would you turn, off, turn up the light, please, Jim? Now, although the right-hand radiograph on this previous slide did show all of the third molar, it was quite badly superimposed and overlapped by the second molar. Now, I'd like to explain what causes this overlapping. And to do this, I'll use some simple uh, props. I have two red cardboard boxes that I'll place close to one another, simulating the third, second and third molar. There is an interproximal space. Behind here, we have a card, which takes the place of the film packet. And then we will use a source of visible light rather than invisible x-rays. Now, t turn down the lights, please. I'm directing the rays properly so that the images of these two molars are separated. Now, if I change the direction of the beam, in this manner, the space closes and the images are overlapped. If I go the other way, the space opens, reaches its maximum width, diminishes, and again overlaps. So it is this movement of the X-ray beam the horizontal angulation that controls whether or not the images overlap. All right, lights, please. 
There is an alternate way of radiographing these teeth without having overlapping occur. And uh, I can demonstrate them using a simple uh, graphic. Now this method is described just uh, in very brief outline in the handout that you received at the beginning of this hour. You'll find it on the second page. Now let's say that this is a radiograph of a second and third molar. The third molar is impacted. The roots were not included. So I want to radiograph these teeth, hopefully to show the roots. Now the way in which I do this is this. I will take a scissors and make a cut opposite the contact between the first and second molars and a second cut removing the film above the second molar. Then this first radiograph is positioned on top of the second film packet in a certain manner. I position them so that I've allowed enough area of film to record these missing roots. Now this is merely an educated guess. Now to ensure that I can place the film in this precise position relative to the teeth requires that I take a pen and mark on my uh, film packet a vertical line stressing where the contact of the first and second molar should be and then a horizontal line indicating where the occlusal surface of the second molar shall lie. Then this packet is taken to the patient's mouth and inserted according to the dictates of these two lines. And if my guess has been a good one and the roots were not excessively long or curved or, or something like that, Morning. There's some football game on Saturday. Glad to see you're all recovered from that, but today what I want to do is get back to some statistics. Okay, the student two sample t-test that we discussed last time, you'll recall, is appropriate to the situation in which we have two independent samples uh, from two populations which we are assume have the structure that the variable of interest is you normally distributed is. in population one. I mean, it's normally it's distributed it's with it's mean it's it's of it's I don't know why I'm here. And very what you doing, sir? Did you go to the and the very yeah, over there to the uh, population the game? Did you go to the guys like it <clears throat> to the game <clears throat> The variable of interest in uh, population two uh, is denoted by y, and it's again just as the x variable is assumed to have a normal distribution with mean yeah, use of y. What's and this is the hypothesis so that we tested last time, there. that the means of the two samples were equal. And variance sigma squared, where sigma squared in both populations is assumed to be How much the same. We're expecting eight more. Eight now, if, uh, if I could have everybody's attention, what I'd like to do today is to generalize this model a little bit, talk about a slightly different situation mm -hmm. in which the x and y's are no longer independent from one another, but they have a correlated uh, structure to them. That is, one situation in which this could happen is where X and Y are pairs of observations on the same individual. Now, if we let D sub I denote the sample observation, the sample differences, say X I minus Y I, for some set of individuals, we want to test the hypothesis that delta is equal to zero. Constantly and we'll use these DIs to test eat, this eat, hypothesis. Uh, You're going to employ health educators there? Right. Mr. Yeah, Walker and Mr. Johnson, now what I would like to say is that you should be listening to what I have to say here today. As you well know, there's going to be an exam on this material in two weeks, and you are not only jeopardizing your chances of passing that exam, but also those of the other students in this class who have to listen to what I've got to say today. Now, if you can't listen, I don't know how else you're going to get this material. So I would suggest that what you do is listen to what I have to say for the rest of this lecture. No more, okay? No more. Okay, now where was I? Uh, we're talking about how to test this hypothesis that delta is equal to zero using sets of observations <laughs> di equal, equal to xi, yi. I don't know what he's doing. And uh, anyway, we want to see whether or not the sample this. information 
well, is enough for us to conclude that delta is equal to zero. So we look at these individual yeah, differences. You got some. Yeah, you can still expect a few more to die, aren't you? All right, now, God damn it, that's enough. I'm tired of this stuff. Now, when you leave this room, I don't have any time to live, put up with that kind of disruption. Now, the rest of the people in this class have a right to learn, and you two, out. You are disrupting this course, and I don't want to have any more of it. And the rest of you take a lesson from this. If there's any interruption of what I have to say in this class, out. Don't come. Finished. Out. OK, I'm glad to see you all here today. Since we are a little behind in our schedule, I'd like to get right into the lecture. Yes, Jackson? I was wondering if you graded the blue books from the exams we had last month. As a matter of fact, I did. I graded those over the weekend, and the grades will be posted outside my office on the bulletin board at noon today. Yes? Since you indicated that the test was important, when are we going to get our blue books back? Look, my office is crammed full of blue book exams, term papers, etc. I disposed of them over the weekend. Ah, oh, sir, you told it. us that the tests were going to count heavily in our grade. How are we supposed to Look, know how Look, you all it? know pretty much how you did on this exam. You know where your mistakes are, and you know where you stand in the course so far, and we simply cannot afford to take any extra time to explain it in detail. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to get on with today's lecture, since we are a little behind. <laughs> student cannot possibly be exposed to all the information that he might potentially need, let alone be expected to learn. Thus, the process of carving out a set of instructional objectives involves deciding how much information and which information one dares not to teach. Are there any questions? When you stop to think of it, much of the educational process involves just such decisions. A textbook, for example, is a judicious reduction of information. One generalization is designed to cover many situations. One chapter, as indicated frequently by references at the end, covers the points made in many books. All of us know from experience as students how important it is to learn what portion of the required work is really required in order to pass a course. What we may not know as students is that we are responding quite appropriately rather than inappropriately when we are learning to cut corners. It seems increasingly imperative, however, that the teacher join rather than oppose the student in the game of how little do we dare look at. There are really only a very few basic things that can be done about the situation. First, we can search for simplified ways of describing complex phenomena. Second, we can organize things that a person might want to look at in a more efficient manner. And third, we can make information more available in a simple physical sense than we have in the past. The problem of pinpointing a course's objectives involves the first two points directly. In addition, only if you have a carefully defined and interrelated list of objectives can you possibly make... The purpose of this seminar is to give you an opportunity to hear and see mistakes that you make in communication skills with your patients. When you see errors on the tape, stop the tape from rolling by simply telling the technician to stop. And then we'll discuss the points of, of concern and the errors. Roll the tapes, please. Be sure now that you're the ones who stop this tape, because if you don't do so, I shall have to, and I would prefer very much that you stop the tapes. It's more important that you recognize these errors and point them out than that I do. First of all, we have found that you have what is called periodontitis or periodontal disease, known to most people as pyorrhea. This is quite an extensive condition in your case, and we're going to have to clear it up before we can begin Stop treatment. Tape. Now, when you talk to your patient about periodontitis, what do you think that means to him? Uh, well, I assumed he was a fairly intelligent man, and uh, being very familiar with the term ourselves, I more or less took for advantage that he did. Do you agree to that? Have you done a workup with this patient before, or is this the first time you've seen him? Well, he had no questions on about the condition I was explaining to him. But the point is, do you think he understood what periodontitis is? Well, he did use pyorrhea after he said periodontitis. Does that mean anything? Yeah, I think most people know what pyorrhea is. You, most people. Do you think, th you think people know what pyorrhea is? Yeah. They know, they've heard the term. Do you think they know what it is? 
I think that uh, most people yeah. have don't, don't certain you, feelings. Don't you think it will be more meaningful if you showed them an illustration of what, what it is? Something of this kind. That may yeah, be helpful. Do you think it may be helpful? Don't you think it will really put the point across? I think I'd be a little more comfortable if the patient had said anything to indicate That's that uh, he either was or was not uh, understanding what the student was presenting to well, perhaps to elicit something. I think the important point is is that if you expect a patient to make a large investment in dental treatment, he must understand what's being done or what's to be done and what the problems are. And if you talk in technical terminology, he's going to be worrying about the meaning of those words instead of communicating with you or listening to you so you can communicate to him and you tune him out. Let's roll the tape. Uh, the, the important point that we have to resolve here is whether or not we try to get the patient's vocabulary up to our level and then talk to him in our terms, or do we talk to him in history? We'll have some missing teeth. Let me show you here on the models that I've taken uh, where your missing teeth are. Back here on both sides, 18, 19, 20, and uh, over here. Uh, these teeth will all have to be uh, replaced in, in order to restore your occlusion and bite. Hold it. We'll replace the these. With what do you mean by occlusion bite in 18 and 19 and 20, Mr. Hughes? I know what you mean. What do you think the patient thinks you mean? Well, I, I was trying to point them out to them, you know, the teeth and uh, more or less... You mean give them a course in neural anatomy? Well, obviously they weren't there. What do you think of that? Well, well, I agree with Tom. He did use the models, so he was showing where these teeth were. So and the he, patient's and he worrying said about bite. 18, 19, 20. He's worrying about uh, uh, the other things that, that he talked about terminology-wise, and, and he's not listening to what the, the, the dentist says at all. I think it might be better. He did have models, and he could show at least if the teeth were not present to where they were. It's sort of better than saying uh, first bicuspid or something along those lines. Do you lines. have to use any kind of a designation, numbers or bicuspids or molars or anything like that, when you simply point to missing teeth on the model? He did, you notice, though, look at least at the patient's face, and yeah, I think he, because he said no over here, at least it means that he realized at that moment that the patient didn't. I'm glad you mentioned the matter of the patient's face, because as I saw the patient's face, he was tuned out completely, if you can judge from that, yeah, and you generally can. One of the questions that comes into the seminar like this, Mr. Hughes, is why didn't you follow the pattern that we gave you to do the case presentation? I thought I presented in a logical way. Right on, I presented a situation. Right there on the monitor. And, uh, it's right there on the monitor. You can't argue with it. You didn't follow the pattern that we set up, and I want to know why not. In our discussion a little while ago, there seemed to be some agreement that um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about are questions that we wanted to address ourselves to. Before the session was over today, um, is the question of um, is there a role for student anxiety in the teaching learning process? And I remember us raising that a little while ago, and I wondered whether we wanted to kind of move into that question right now. Does that still seem to be um, an important issue for everybody for us to spend a little time on? Yeah, I was I was the one who brought it up initially, and and I have some real feelings that anxiety is more a hindrance to student learning than necessarily a help. Mm -hmm. I think students get so tied up in, in their fears and, and anxiety that they don't learn anything. Well, you really don't see any role for it at all. Well, I, I, maybe at minimal. But on the other hand, uh, isn't uh, a certain amount of anxiety necessary to make the individual conscientious? If they were completely devoid of it, uh, they may slack off. By creating, yeah, well, that's true. I think I can agree with that. If you have some anxiety, if you present anxiety or give <coughs> the students something that sort of to look forward to, uh, that will create some of that anxiety that I think would make him or her get involved a little bit more. I feel that, that person would probably become more involved if you create some anxiety for him. So you kind of see anxiety as a motivational force. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Well, it, 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 it has to be in context. You don't, uh, a certain amount, I'm, I'm advocating a certain amount, certainly to an extreme, it uh, could definitely become detrimental. So it's kind of the middle of the road, a happy medium. Yeah. How does that sound to you now that, that he's that um, Mike has put it that way? 
Well, I don't know. I still have some real misgivings because I think that too often instructors can't gauge how much anxiety students possess. And, and they may have some of this anxiety that Clancy was talking about within them to begin with. You don't have to create it. I just don't, you know, most of the time I think we're always asking the wrong question. It seems to me that, uh, you know, we ask, is there a role for anxiety? And as if we had some sort of choice. Anxiety exists. We always have it. We don't have any choice to make in the matter. We've got, I mean, people sit and knit is one way of getting rid of their anxiety. They don't have anything, you know, to do about it. And if I were an instructor, how could I do anything about the student? What would make one student anxious would probably not help another student at all. And yeah. maybe another student <clears throat> would be relieved by whatever I did. What just what have no control. What are you thinking, Gabriel, about um, Dick's question of whether we're addressing ourselves right now to the right question or not? I, I, I got sidetracked. I wonder if uh, you could repeat yourself. Oh. Well, maybe... maybe um, well, it's, you know, it seems it. like it's a pretty straightforward point. Uh, if, you, if you talk with students and they'll either react or not react, but what you do to one student isn't going to uh, make any uh, impression on another student. Some people will just sit and look back. You don't know whether they're anxious or not. You don't really have much control over it. Seems to me like we're missing the point on the question. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? I mean, no, you just, not at all. <laughs> I think you're way off base. Well, what's your reaction when you're sitting here? I mean, you just sit here and uh, you hardly ever say anything. And, and then we talk about anxiety and you're a student and we're a student and we're supposed to, to talk about this stuff. What, what does it mean to you? Well, I just, uh, I just. I mean, uh, this is a graduate course. You know, we expect everybody to sort of contribute to the whole thing, and. And so, what's that got to do with me? Well, I just think you're an example of what we're talking about. How so? Well, I mean, we're talking about anxiety, and I, it seems to me that you're coming over as you're not, you're not ready to talk about the issue, and you're just, you know, just sort of sitting back. I mean, uh, <clears throat> and then we're supposed to talk about how we're supposed to help students fight anxiety. Yet, uh, you know. Well, maybe. You're I'm not so an example, and you won't say anything. Well, maybe that's because I do have anxiety. Well, okay, and I'm then. I'm afraid to say anything, and people like you start talking, and I hate to say a word because I'm afraid of a put down. Say, Dick, uh, is uh, well, there yeah, something but that. I, no, it's, this, this is really important. Is there it. something that, that Elaine has done that's bothered you? Well, it's what she hasn't done. I don't think she's helped, you know, and you, you sit here, and, you know, it doesn't seem to me like uh, we're getting anything out of this type of meeting in the first place. We sit around and talk about some nebulous question oh, and never really get that's down to true, the necessarily. Well, we don't go anywhere in this type of thing. We just, you know, sit around and somebody says, Well yes, this is a pretty good idea. No, it's not such a good idea, but when what comes out of it? I don't know whether, you know, what you get out of it at all or what anyone gets out of it. And nobody seems to really say. At the end we don't sum up anything. Well, sometimes I feel that we don't always have the answer, and I think it's what we're trying to do is to work through it. And when we do get a chance to work through it, I think we have a chance to see some other points of view. I don't think we're going to come up with the answer at the end of the semester anyhow. Well, I don't think we're going to come up with the answer because we're not asking the right questions. Well, that's possible. And, uh, well, what are the right questions, then? Well, uh, I think that uh, if we would concentrate on asking questions instead of just sort of sitting back. That well, we would... did ask BS what anxiety was. Yeah, well, we never got down to finding that out either. You well, think you, you got an idea of what anxiety is and what it means in a classroom situation by a few people sitting around and talking about it? I think I have a better feel for it from that. Well, what, well I don't even know what well, you mean you, by that. If you don't, what are you doing here? Uh, well, sometimes, I, you know, I sometimes ask myself this when we're just, you know, sitting around and, and talking and not going anywhere. That seems to sum up the whole course, don't you think? Well, you surely seem to feel strenuous about what you're saying. Um, well, I think I have a right to, to feel that way. Well, I'm, su I'm sure you do, and it's helpful for you to feel free to express your, you know, your feelings in here about what we're doing. Well, I, that's where you, you leave me, because I don't know whether it's helpful or not. I mean, how can you just say it's helpful? This is just another term that we just sort of bash around. How do you know when you're, you're helping somebody? How do I know if I'm helping you or hurting you when I talk to you? How do I know how you're going to react?
got to have that fixed by 2.30 this afternoon. We're preparing tissues at uh, 2 o'clock, so we've got to have that vacuum fixed on the lipolyzer. Okay, thanks. I'd appreciate it if you could be here at that time. Boy, yeah. What a day. Yeah, I, uh... Question two. Well, question two was a problematical bar graph, and it involved a completion of uh, three of the components. Really, it's a small part of the entire exam. Uh, I... Yes? Hi, Vince. Hi, Chuck. Uh, you know those slides we prepared yesterday? Mm hmm Sure. I just finished staining one of them with hematoxylin, and it looks very interesting under the microscope. I think you should come down and take a look at it. Well, right now, uh, kind of busy for the next few minutes. Uh, how about later this morning? I can't make it this afternoon. Well, I can't busy. either, so later this morning will be fine. Okay, let's say in an hour. Okay. that be fine? Okay, that'll okay, be Okay, right. hour and a half, fine. See you later. Okay. Okay, back to question two here. Yeah, um... Uh, I think if you could... Oh, excuse me. Yes. Oh, fine. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, the serial number and all the warranty material will be here for that, uh, for that item. So if you could... Uh, I guess Tom did mention that to you. We have to have that fixed by 2 o'clock. Fine. Thanks a lot. I'll leave that with my secretary then. Thank you. Okay, back to question two again. Uh, question two is a very small part of the entire exam. It's only the second exam, as a matter of fact, and your grades are good on both of them. I wouldn't concern yourself with question two. We've got uh, four more exams, and I'm sure uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, come to me after the next exam. I have... Uh, I'm going to have to get off the lecture. Uh, any further questions, wait till after the next exam, and, and that'll be fine. I'm going to have to go. What courses did you have in mind? Well, I would suggest going across the street to the uh, Allison A School and taking uh, one of their courses, perhaps, in the uh, social science area, anthropology, history, uh, any of the psychology courses, political science. One course I would strongly suggest is social psychology. I, I took a social psychology course, I think it was 570, 572. Oh yeah, when here I was here. Uh, in graduate school, and, and it's very appropriate for uh, uh, dentists and, uh, and dental teachers, and I got a lot out of that course. Uh, so I, I strongly would suggest uh, social psych, 570. Well, that looks like a good suggestion. I think I'll give that some thought. Herb, do you have any plans for next year? Any definite plans for next year? Well, no, I don't really. I don't think I'm going to have to worry about the Army particularly. So I just sort of assumed I'd go on, get my degree and go on into practice. Have you ever considered graduate school? No. No, I haven't. Well, I think I, if I were you, I would seriously consider graduate school, Herb. We need people of your caliber in, in dental teaching. And uh, if you haven't thought about it before, I, I think that this is the time to start thinking about it. I would encourage you to take it quite seriously. Well, thank you. I, I will. I, that's a new, new idea, but I'd like, like to explore it. Fine. I wish you would. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about uh, uh, at this time? No, I think I'm ready to do some thinking now. Thank you. Fine. Good, good. I hope you do. Okay. Come back any time. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hi. How'd it go, Herb? Oh, pretty well. Pretty good session. What did he think of your idea for an independent study? Well, he suggested I take a course over in the Lit School instead, a social psychology course. Well, at least you get something out of your advisor. Mine's got this damn non-directive approach. You know, I get out of him like I get out of a brick wall. It's, you know, what do you think? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, uh, you know. No, oh, mine's pretty good. I really like what he has to say. You know, he's got some good ideas. Well, that's great. I guess that's what you know. Dr. Hartley? Yes. Uh, this is Roger Rice. Yes, Roger. Uh, excuse me for bothering you at this hour of the night. Your wife, uh, I called your house. Your wife said it would be all right if, if I called you at the office if it was important. No bother. I was just grading papers. What's up? Well, you know, you said earlier this year that we should call you if we had any problems. And, well, you know, um, I'm having a lot of trouble in anatomy. And I'm uh, 
wondering if I can talk with you about it. Uh, have you talked with your anatomy instructor about it? Uh, well, no. Uh, but I just can't understand what's wrong. I I'm spending an awful lot of time on it. And like the more I study, the less I seem to know. Uh, I don't know what's wrong. Uh, maybe you could just help me find what's wrong. I don't know what I can do, but I'll be glad to talk with you. Uh, can you come in Thursday sometime? Well, um, the midterm's tomorrow. And I really don't, don't see how I'm going to pass it. I, I'm really uptight. And I was sort of hoping I could see you tonight. Gee, Roger, I don't know what good it would do this late. Well, maybe you could just sort of help me get things straightened out. I, I just know it would help if I could come to talk with you tonight. Oh, uh, are you sure it can't wait? I still have quite a few papers to grade, and I hope to give them back tomorrow. But I just don't know what to do. And, well, that, that's just part of it. Um, it's sort of hard to explain over the phone. But I just don't know what I'm going to do. And, well, that's just part of it. Um, it's sort of hard to explain over the phone. Well, my wife just doesn't understand uh, about school, you know, and she can't. Um, just tonight, she threatened to leave me, and I wonder if you could come over and talk with her, or, or, or could we come over and see you? Coming along with that statistics course. Well, it's turned out to be a lot more work than anybody expected. Yeah, she doesn't mind putting you through the paces to get a grade in that course. Well, you wouldn't mind doing the work so much if you thought that there would be some relevancy to the course. I don't think how we're ever going to use this material. Oh, I think you'll find some use for it. In that course that you have with me next term, we'll find some relevancy, I'm sure. Well, I hope so. It's make it a lot easier to study. Well, are you putting in a lot of time? Oh, every night. Oh, that's good. Well, keep up the good work and stop by and see me sometime. We'll talk about it again. Okay, we'll see you later. Okay. Dr. Cern? Oh, Bill, how are you getting along? Well, I'm a little upset today. It's something that's been bothering me for a while. What seems to be the problem? Well, I think you may, you may know that there's been stuff disappearing from the lab lately. Oh, yeah, I've heard. Yeah, well, I, I think I know something about it, and uh, I've been given a lot of thought to it lately, and I, I really feel like I need to talk to somebody about it. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah, well, I have... Uh, you know, I've even given some thought to going in and talking to uh, somebody in the dean's office about it. But, uh, you know, I just, just haven't really reached any decision. Well, would you like to speak with me? Well, gee, you know, I don't even know whether I, I feel like I should be talking with you. From the wires of the Associated Press in the WSLW newsroom, here are the news headlines. Premier Jordan continues his world tour despite yesterday's nearly successful assassination attempt. The Paris peace talks enter their third year with no change in the stalemate in sight. Withdrawal of U.S. overseas troops slows despite lowest casualties in seven months. A large oil spill threatens wildlife along the southeast Gulf Coast. No arrests have been made in the latest church bombing in the South in which six persons were seriously injured. The Kennedy family makes an early morning visit to Arlington on this anniversary of assassination. On the state scene, four cities have been added to the list of those with rising unemployment rates. State traffic records show more than 2,000 highway fatalities so far this year. Police have made 30 arrests and confiscated an undisclosed amount of marijuana in the latest crackdown on dope pushing. Officials warn that the inner-city crime rate will continue to rise unless a massive counterattack is mounted. And the governor's office warns of additional cuts in current appropriations for welfare and education. Those are the headlines. Stay tuned now for further details.
You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.